Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Friday, the 14th of November. You're tuned in to our mid morning newscast here on Arirang TV. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Addressing the ASEAN Plus 3 summit in Myanmar, President Park Geun hye proposes a three way summit between South Korea, China, and Japan. The Korean leader has just landed in Australia for this year's G20 summit. Less than 24 hours after the Philae probe made a historic touchdown on a comet, the first close-up images of the alien landscape have been sent back to Earth, but concerns remain about the probe's battery life after a very bumpy landing. Plus, Liberia's president lifts the state of emergency imposed to control a deadly Ebola outbreak that has killed hundreds in the West African country. Our top story this morning, it's been quite a busy week for regional diplomacy, especially for President Park Geun-hye, who, on top of her many other agenda items, has expressed hope for a trilateral summit with China and Japan in the near future. Our Che Yusun has more from the ASEAN Plus Three meeting in Myanmar. At an annual meeting with the leaders of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, China and Japan, hosted by Myanmar this year, President Park Geun-hye has openly expressed hopes to meet her Chinese and Japanese counterparts. This comes as historical and territorial differences in Northeast Asia have led tensions to rise in the region. The last time the three countries' leaders met was in 2012. A slight gaining of diplomatic momentum among the three nations was witnessed at the APEC summit in Beijing earlier this week when President Park talked about a tripartite foreign minister's meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Park also had a brief encounter with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, where the two leaders agreed to encourage officials involved in high-level talks to make progress in resolving Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. The leaders of China and Japan also met on the sidelines of that global forum. It, however, remains to be seen how the latest rounds of diplomacy and reconciliatory gestures will work to thaw Korea's relations with Japan, as Seoul is adamant Tokyo must first take responsibility for its past wrongdoings. Crediting the ASEAN cooperation and trust building as a model for her Northeast Asia peace initiative, President Park also sought the ASEAN, China and Japan support in encouraging North Korea to lay down its nuclear arms for the region's peace and stability. President Park now heads to Brisbane, Australia to attend this year's G20 Leaders Summit. There she will continue promoting her economic innovation plan as an initiative to address global problems of low growth and high unemployment. Choi Yusan, Arirang News, Nepida. And staying in Myanmar, President Park and the leaders of 17 nations concluded their annual East Asia Summit on Thursday, addressing a number of regional and global issues. The Korean leader called on the other member nations to actively cooperate in regional disaster management and health. On the Ebola crisis, the president spoke of Korea's dispatch of a medical team to West Africa, Sierra Leone more specifically, and endorsed the East Asia Summit's plan to boost preventive systems to fight and hopefully defeat the deadly virus. President Park has now just arrived in Australia, in fact, to attend the G20 Summit in Brisbane, the final leg of her current international trip. Now, after an epic 10-year journey through the darkest reaches of space, the final steps of the Rosetta mission haven't really gone quite according to plan. Its probe managed to touch down on the comet, but only after bouncing twice and landing on its side in the shadow of a crater wall. Scientists at the European Space Agency fear the probe's batteries could be about to give out with no chance of popping out there with a spare. Our Jimmy Argyll reports. The Philae space probe that made history by touching down on a comet half a billion kilometers from Earth has achieved another remarkable first by sending back stunning images of the comet's surface. The photo released by the European Space Agency shows one of the lander's legs and the jagged rocky surface of the comet. The agency thinks the lander could be resting on its side, possibly with one leg extended into open space and concerns are rising about the probe's battery life. 
Philae appears to be sitting under the shadow of a huge crater wall, so scientists may have a hard time recharging its solar batteries. Scientists have been hoping for six to seven hours of sunlight to charge the batteries, but it looks like Philae will only get a maximum of two hours of illumination during every 12-hour rotation of the comet. Under the current circumstances, Philae may cease to operate beyond Saturday. Engineers are thinking of repositioning the probe to maximize the lander's exposure to sunlight. Regardless of what happens in the coming days, the mission's priority will be on collecting as much information as possible from the comet. Researchers hope to pull up some subsurface material for laboratory analysis. Scientists believe comets delivered water to planets and may hold some answers to the origins of life and the formation of the solar system. Philae has a Twitter account with all the latest images from the comet's surface. Users can check them out by following at Philae 2014. Jim young Arirang News. Now back here in Korea, and uh, the National Assembly's Foreign Affairs Committee has passed bills for three free trade agreements with Australia and Canada, and this is paving the way for their full ratification of those pacts early next month. The ruling and opposition parties say they will ratify the trade agreements no later than December 2nd. To quell concerns, the FTAs will negatively impact Korea's livestock sector. The ministers of finance and agriculture agreed to offer local livestock farmers cheap loans and advice on how to export their products. Now to a bleak projection about China's future growth. A U.S. research institute, the Conference Board, predicts China's annual growth will tumble to the 3% range in just five years from now. At a press conference in New York on Thursday, the institute said it expects the Chinese economy to experience a, quote, soft fall over the next decade or so. Unlike a soft landing, which means economic stabilization after a recession, soft fall means China's economic momentum will continue to deteriorate due to its transition from a mostly export-driven to a more domestically focused economy. It says China's economic growth will begin to slow from next year, falling to 6.5% in 2015 from this year's 7% plus growth rate. Now, it has emerged that the Korean government sucked in a staggering 50 billion US dollars in tax revenue from the sales of goods like cigarettes, alcohol and lottery tickets in 2012. In a report released on Thursday, the Korea Tax Association said taxes on so-called SIN products accounted for 27% of total revenue uh, two years ago. It was almost as much, in fact, as revenue generated through VAT, or value-added taxes, which is the government's main source of income. SIN tax revenue outstripped both corporate and income tax in the year 2012. Watchers say if Parliament passes a bill on raising taxes on cigarettes, the proportion of the government's revenue from the so-called sin taxes will grow even more in the years to come. Critics say high sin taxes are unfair as they mostly target low-income earners. The UN envoy on North Korean human rights has once again called on referring the regime's leader, Kim Jong-un, to the International Criminal Court. This comes as the UN General Assembly is expected to adopt a resolution on North Korean human rights next month. Ao Hwang sang reports. UN Special Rapporteur on North Korean Human Rights Marzuki Darusman reiterated that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un should be taken to the International Criminal Court for his serious human rights violations. Uh, it's, it's only now that we are now in a position to in fact direct culpability on the supreme leader for these massive human rights violations. At a forum in Seoul on Thursday, the UN envoy said the report published by the Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in North Korea pointed unequivocally to the North Korean leadership for being responsible for the inhumane treatment of its 25 million population. 
noting Pyongyang's recent invitation to the Rosman. U.S. Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights Issues Robert King said the report is effective in slowly changing the North. He's been denied visits to North Korea for four and a half years. The North Koreans indicate that they're willing to invite him to Pyongyang as long as the text of the resolution is modified. I think these are all very clear indications of North Korean concerns about the focus on their human rights record. As the U.N. General Assembly prepares to vote on the human rights resolution in mid-December, the two human rights figures agreed on adding more pressure on the regime. Both Daruzman and King agreed that the next crucial step would be to link the North Korean human rights issue with security dimensions by listing it in the agenda of the U.N. Security Council. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Now, Korea, China and Japan have decided to strengthen measures to jointly tackle rising concerns over fine dust particles in Northeast Asia. Delegations from the 11th Tripartite President's Meeting taking place in Japan said on Friday that they all see eye to eye on the need to come up with new means to control uh, this dust, so-called yellow dust and just uh, general air pollution. During the five-day meeting, Korea has also been sharing its policies on things like bird flu and environmental radioactivity. Representatives from the three countries will meet again next November, this time in the southern Korean city of Yosu. Well, it's time now to check out some of the other global headlines we're following on this Friday morning in Seoul. For that, we turn, as always, to Eunice Kim, who's standing by for us at the News Centre. Hello there, Eunice. Good morning, Mark. Plenty of developments on the Ebola front uh, this Friday. Firstly, vaccines are going to undergo trials in the worst hit countries in West Africa. This, in fact, as Liberia has uh, called an end to its national state of emergency. Right. Let's go ahead and begin with that latter development, Mark. Liberia's president announced on Thursday that she is lifting that state of emergency, citing improvements in the fight against Ebola in her country. While noting that the fight against the deadly virus was not over, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf said the country had come a long way since August when it became the outbreak's epicenter, and the government had determined there was enough progress to lift the emergency measure. Meanwhile, Doctors Without Borders has agreed to partner with researchers in Europe to test two experimental drugs and one blood treatment at its clinics in West Africa, including those in Guinea and Liberia. So far, there is no vaccine for the hemorrhagic virus that has now killed more than 5,100 people and infected more than 14,000, according to the WHO, most of those cases in Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea. On to the crisis in Ukraine. Moscow and Kiev are exchanging barbs that the other had violated a September ceasefire. This as NATO accuses Russia of sending military equipment and troops into rebel-held eastern Ukraine. International Monitor, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, also known as the OECD, said it spied a vehicle marked Cargo 200 among the clusters of Russian tanks, artillery and air defense systems and entering Ukraine, and that is apparently a vehicle used to transport soldiers' bodies. The United Nations Security Council, meanwhile, also convened its 26th emergency session on Ukraine on Thursday on concerns that full-scale fighting could break out in the country's east. The Islamic State group has released audio, it says, capture the voice of its leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, to apparently quell rumors that the 44-year-old had been killed in U.S.-led coalition airstrikes last weekend. Released via social media, the voice in the 17-minute recording says the extremist group will never stop fighting in Iraq and Syria. It also mentions new oaths of allegiance from Egypt, Algeria and Liberia and called on supporters to, quote, erupt volcanoes of jihad across the world, including in Saudi Arabia, the leaders of which the voice says represents the head of the snake. 
And attention all history buffs, do you know this hat? The belongings of French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte will be going to auction this weekend in France, including, of course, his iconic bicorn hat. Monaco's Prince Andrew said in a written statement his family will use the proceeds to refurbish their palace and also to give the relics a new lease on life. The items were originally collected by the prince's great-grandfather, Louis II, who was a big admirer of Napoleon. The hat is expected to fetch up to 400,000 euros, or a handsome half a million U.S. dollars. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia, and beyond. On air, on your mobile, and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 50 billion. Now let's uh, take a look at some culture news because Korea's largest art fair, which is devoted to introducing limited edition artwork, opened in the Korean capital on Thursday. Now, the art comes from far, far and wide, and it's not only limited to works by Korean artists. Our Park ji took a look around and filed us this report. Ranging from photos and woodcut prints to 3D computer artwork, this fair is all about art pieces that have a limited number of editions. Since 1995, the annual International Art Fair has invited a number of participants and guests from all over the world. This year includes 51 galleries from 15 countries. Those who visit will get close access to the artists themselves and exhibit booths. My works are about the endless networks of our lives that interconnect everyone. It looks like a plant as plants represent the circles of life, from its creation to extinction. In this project, um, I did a performance in a site near the Auschwitz camp where people were shot. And I asked the audience, there were about 300 people, I asked them to write down the names of the people they love and put them in candles and the candles went down the river to the ocean. So it became this kind of celebration of life. On the sidelines of the festival, diverse programs are being offered, from artist talks and collaborative projects to printmaking classes. The festival continues until this Sunday at the Hangaram Art Museum of Seoul Arts Center. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Now, having an open channel of communication within uh, families is, of course, extremely important, but oftentimes it's easier said than done. Well, our Im Yun hee introduces us to a play staged at the Seoul Arts Centre in southern Seoul, which addresses this very topic. Billy is the youngest of three children, but he's the only one in the family who's deaf, and he never really learned sign language. As a result, his range of communication is strained and limited. But then he meets Sylvia, the daughter of two deaf parents, who's fluent in sign language and slowly going deaf herself. The two come from entirely different worlds from entirely different families. They come from their own tribes. First of all, this story is about loving your family. But in a tribe that's called a family, members show that love in ways that they see fit, not the ways that others need to receive it. And under this kind of system, Billy, as well as other members of the tribe, are the direct results showing what happens when love becomes a selfish act. Sign language is another valuable source of communication, especially for those who are hearing impaired, those who may feel a bit outside the traditional means of communication. And here, the tables have turned. Speech is no longer as meaningful as, say, signals from the hands and movements from the body. But with the loss of one sense comes sensitivity to the others, especially the realization of the power of words. A set of words dancing in the corner of your eyes suddenly fades away with just a few blinks, much too quickly to comprehend. These subtitles, often taken for granted, 
are now a source of confusion and misunderstanding as they're continually flung across the stage. Deaf people have a harder time understanding others' spoken words, and it often becomes more about the feeling than the actual facts. That's why we made it so these subtitles are fleeting, and it becomes frustrating to read. We paint a quick image to show the feelings of the speakers and create the overwhelming experience we want to share. Although it's not the traditional approach to a play, sometimes it takes someone else's point of view, someone different. To appreciate what you have, a tribe is made up of members, each with his or her own imperfections, but together, they share values and customs to make the perfect tribe, the perfect family. Im Yun Hee, Arirang News. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off in football this time, where Manchester United ambassador Park Ji Sung was in Seoul on Thursday for the Manchester United media conference. Now, after expressing his gratitude and becoming an ambassador for his former team, he spoke about the current struggles the English club is currently facing, stating it's a phase that could happen when you change managers. He also added that although the Korean national football team is filled with young talents, it could be a tough task for them to win the upcoming Asian Cup, adding they need more time to adjust to head coach Uli Stilike's style of football. And speaking of which, the Korean national football team is set to play a couple of friendlies this month, starting off with a big match later tonight against Jordan. With the 66th-ranked Taeguk Warriors facing off against the 74th-ranked Jordan at away, big questions surround the Korean national team with their star Son Heung-min likely out due to fatigued calves. But it's likely that filling in his role will be Kim Minu, who is considered manager Uli Stilike's go-to guy so far in the short time he's managed the team. Meanwhile, Park Ji Young will be in the spotlight as well after being given his second chance with the national team once again. And moving on to the football pitch and to the ice rink, where the 2014-2015 ISU Speed Skating World Cup begins its new season at Salt Lake City, Utah. And for the fans here in Korea, all eyes will be on the two-time Olympic champion Lee Sang Hwa, who hopes to continue her dominance in the 500-meter event with Lee Sung Hoon and Mo Tae Bum looking to bounce back in the men's competition. But who can forget Park Seung Hee, the former Olympic short track gold medalist who is set to make her international debut in speed skating. Meanwhile, with seven World Cup events taking place this season, Korea will host the second event from November 21st to the 23rd. And now finishing things off in the major leagues where the Cy Young Award winners were announced and not much of a surprise over in the National League. Now receiving 30 out of 30 first place votes, LA Dodgers lefty Clayton Kershaw was voted unanimously as the 2014 National League Cy Young winner, winning his third in the past four years. Now Kershaw finished the season at 21-3 with a jaw-dropping 1.77 ERA. Meanwhile, over in the American League, Cleveland Indian Corey Kluber won his first Cy Young after posting a record of 18-9 with a 2.44 ERA and 269 strikeouts, beating out Felix Hernandez and Chris Saley. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. And Incheon received snow for the first time of the season in very early hours, and that's about four days earlier than previous year. And this morning, the capital area woke up to the sub-zero temperatures once again, minus one here in Seoul. Though unlike yesterday, the air is much cleaner and fresher. Also, winds have died out, and plenty of sunshine will shine down on us throughout the day. So uh, temperatures should.
should be a bit milder than yesterday as the daytime high in the capital will rise to 10, while Daegu tops out at 11 and Gwangju and Busan will climb to 12 this afternoon. And on to other regions. Jeju Island and Daejeon will be getting up to 13 and 10 later on, while Dokdo should see a high of Eight. Well, it seems like this weekend is ex expected to be quite crowded with people around the nation. The college entrance exam ended yesterday and many will hit the roads to enjoy the last minute of autumn color. So the weather should cooperate on Sunday or Saturday day this, but on Sunday it looks like we'll have a nationwide afternoon shower, so uh, please plan accordingly. That's all for now. Let's send it back to Mark in the studio. Well, thank you very much, as always, John, for the weather. And that's going to do it from us. Have a great day or night, wherever you're watching us. I'm Mark Broom, and I'll be back with Arjun Ju at noon Korea time. Until then, goodbye.